So let's start off by looking at the wives of bishops and deacons. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, we do have qualifications, believe it or not, for pastor, bishop, deacons, wives. Okay, believe it or not, even though they're not the one entering the office, there is an expectation that your wives have a certain uh, character about themselves. Okay, not only does this reflect upon them, but this reflects upon you as their husband. You know, for, for the length of time that you've been their husband, you've been the head of your wife, you know, if they're able to show these things, yeah, it's great for her, but it's great for you. Hey, if she lacks in these things, it's bad for her, it's bad for you, all right? Now, here's the, men, you, you cannot detach yourself from your wives. You cannot detach. If there are weaknesses, if there are issues there with your wives, especially if you're desiring the office of the bishop and the uh, deacon, then you need to make sure your wives know what the Bible says and the standard that they are required to live by. So, you know, the worst thing, the worst thing I think would be having a man that meets all the qualifications. He's almost ready to go to be ordained, but then his wife is letting, let, let, you know, uh, is, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm saying? I'm thinking of, um, sorry? Lacking. The wife is lacking. You know, man, you're, you're so prepared, but your, your wife. But here's the thing. He might say, yeah, it's my wife. No, no, no. But then bring it back. No, no. But you're the head of your wife. You should have been addressing these things over the years. Okay. Now, the first thing that I want to I bring up here is that there is no such thing as the office of the pastor's wife. Amen. There's no such thing. Okay, your, your wife is not taking on a leadership position. I know a lot of the, the, the you know, liberal churches these days, you know, would basically they would call what me and my wife is, you know, Pastor Kevin and Pastor Christina Sepulveda, you know, and they'll, they'll give her the office, you know, and, and it's like this married couple both have the office of a, of a bishop, and you know, that's just ridiculous. It's just, you know, flying against the word of God. And so the first thing I want you to understand, and, and this is something that sometimes wives struggle with when they know their husband wants to be a pastor or a deacon or, or these things, but they think, well, what about me? You know, what are going to be, what are the expectations upon me? Well, the only true expectation upon your wife is that she would be not the pastor's wife office, but she would be just the pastor's wife, okay? Just the deacon's wife, the, the bishop's wife. That's all you are. You are just the wife of that man. She's not anybody else's wife. You know, my wife, Christina, she's not your wife. Okay, she's not your wife's wife, all right? She's not the church's wife. You know whose wife she is? She's my wife. She's my wife, and that is her role. That is what's required from her to, to be there for me, to be there for the family, to be there for the home, and to also reflect, you know, a, a mature Christian attitude about her because whether your wife likes it or not, yes, she doesn't have an office, yes, she doesn't have authority, but one thing she must understand is even though that's the case, other ladies in the church are still going to be looking at her as an example, okay? So that's something you just have to realize. Other people are looking at you as an example, looking at your husband, looking at your marriage, looking at your kids. Just those things are expected. We see that in the Bible. We see that godly men are there to be examples to the flock, all right? Now, um, you guys are in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. The Bible says, Even so must their wives be grave. And before I keep reading, this is in the context, if you read the chapter, it's definitely in the context of a deacon. It's definitely talking about the deacon's wife. But I don't believe there's anything wrong with taking this and saying, well, this is obviously also for the bishop's wife. Okay, I mean, your bishop is to be the husband of one wife as well. So we can take this as well. Now, before we keep reading that, it's, oh, I'll just finish reading it. So, so uh, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. Okay, now I'm going to read to you from, if you guys actually, let's, let's go there. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Does the wife have a leadership position in the church? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. And the context here, again, is Paul speaking of himself as not having a wife nor Barnabas. These guys, um, you know, are serving the church and they're saying, look, we, we, we have the power, we have the authority to take, you know, to be able to eat and drink and, and to take care of our needs from the offering that comes from the church. But then they point to 1 Corinthians 9.5 and they say, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, or I only and Barnabas, have we not have have not we power to forbear 
work in. Now, one thought that might come, some pressure that might come upon the pastors is when they take on the role of, 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 a, of a pastor, they take on that office, again, that expectation, well, what's your wife doing? Is your wife going to look after the Sunday school ministry? Is your wife going to take care of the kids? Is your wife going to put on programs for the ladies? You know, is, is your wife going to whatever? Well, whatever it is that people do, there is that expectation. You know, I'm thinking of one uh, pastor who was an assistant pastor, and his wife was fearful of becoming, of, of her husband becoming the senior pastor because she was then, uh, if, if, if she took over, sorry, if he took over that role, then she would be taking over the role of, you know, uh, the wife of that senior pastor before. And that wife of the senior pastor was running ladies' meetings, was training ladies. You know, they had monthly meetings and she was fearful. Well, I, you know, I don't really want to take on that responsibility. That expectation shouldn't be upon the wife. You know, a wife has enough to do. You know, God's created her to look after the husband, to raise the kids, to, to be the keeper at home. You know, it's not her responsibility now to start taking on church ministries, you know? Now, if she can help here and there, that's great. You know, everybody should be helping and serving in the local church. But we see here that when, when, when Paul is speaking about himself as the apostles, those that are in, in authority, that they should be able to lead about their wife. It's not the wife that is doing the leading in the ministry. It's the man, it's the husband doing the leading. And of course, the context here is financial. Not only should a man should be able to look after himself financially from the church, but he should have enough as well received from the church to look after his wife and his family. Okay. Drop down to verse number 9. Uh, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn, doth God take care for oxen. Okay. So the pastor should be doing the job and, and earning the, the, you know, the, fin- the finances, the income, in order to look after him and his family. It's not he and his wife both trading out the corn, both operating as oxes within the church. No, it should be enough that the man does it and by the work that he was able to then provide for himself and his family. All right. So go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 now. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 11. Let's look at the qualifications that are outlined here for your wife. And let me just say this. If you have a desire to be a pastor, let's say you're a single man and you have a desire to be a pastor, you might be thinking, I've got to find a woman who would make a good pastor's wife. Okay? Now, I'd say this is foolish. Okay? I'd say this is just as foolish as a woman, a single woman looking for a man to marry says, look, I want to marry a man who wants to be a pastor. Why don't you just marry the best godly woman you can find? And for for the girl, why don't you just marry the best godly man you can find? Just because you marry a pastor doesn't mean you're going to have a happy life. I mean, he might be a great pastor, but he might be a horrible uh, husband. Do you want that? Do you want Yeah, I've got the status of the pastor's wife, but he treats me like rubbish. You know, he cares more about the flock than he does for me. Hey, he spends more time with other people's families than he does with, with our own family. Is that what you want from a husband? Just so you can have the title of the pastor's, uh, you know, uh, pastor's wife? And the pastor, you know, I'm looking for that, for that woman who, who, you know, who, who's just ready to be that pastor's wife. No, you're missing the point. If you find a good woman, a, a woman who you can love, a woman who can be submissive to you, then you can teach her, then you can guide her, you can be the leader. This is the training ground. You teach your wife, and then when the kids come, you teach the kids, and now you've got the skills, you've got the experiences to now teach the church and deal with situations. If you're looking for that woman, I should have just got to be perfect, you know, just ready to be a pastor's wife, well, you're not then putting any effort to make her, you know, uh, uh, compatible with these things that we see in the Bible, okay? You need to make sure, you know, it's not just finding that perfect woman, it's finding the best woman you can. And then being that leader, being that guide and teaching her these things. The best training ground for any man to be a pastor is to train their wife and train their children. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Even so must their wives be grave. <clears throat> we won't spend too much time on this. We did cover this last month when we looked at the deacons being grave. But if you remember what it meant to be grave, it means to be serious-minded. You know, to be a, someone that's serious, not just mucking around, joking around, everything's fun and games. No, someone that takes... You know, the church and the ministry, seriously, she takes her role seriously. What is her role? To be the wife, to be the mother of the children. She takes that seriously. It's not just fun and games all the time. She understands, you know, the, the, the seriousness of her position. You know, if, if she was to be a, a failure of a mother, if she was to be a failure of a wife, that would damage 
you know, the, the, the uh, potential for her husband to take on uh, an office such as a deacon or a bishop. You know, someone who does what she says. You know, she's serious about what she says. She says, look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to accomplish this task. You know, maybe, you know, that they, they offer to do something for a family in the church. Then they should do, they should complete that. You know, they, they should make sure they're, they're good at communicating. If they can't fulfill what they said, make sure they communicate, hey, look, right now I can't accomplish that, but I can accomplish that, you know, next week or, or whatever it is. Taking serious, you know, uh, what she does, who she is as a person, who she is with the friends that she makes within the church. And she's also grave in the idea that, you know, she realizes that her husband's job is a serious job. You know, uh, being a pastor is not less important than you work in a Monday to Friday nine to five job. You know, it's just as important. You know, you need to still spend those hours preparing, studying, reading the Bible, praying. It's not mucking, mucking around. It's not like, oh, husband, can you go and, and get me that and get me this? Can you go to the shop and get me? No. She realizes these are the hours my husband's studying. These are the hours he's preparing. These are the hours he's working. It's working, right? Studying, praying for the church. These, these things are work. This is, you know, it's labor. You know, and this is what a pastor is called to do, to be in service to the Lord, to, to uh, even mediate, in a, in a sense, for his church, for the people, for the growth of the church, to the Lord God. Because he's able to do that. He's got the time to do that. And he knows that, you know, he, your husband needs to understand his, his job is serious. The wife needs to understand that the job is serious, okay? Now, do I work less hours as a pastor than what I did, you know, with my 9 to 5 job? Yes, I do. I actually uh, work less hours, okay? Now, I, actually, I'm not sure because I've got to travel down to Sydney. That's like a whole day gone. So, I don't know. Maybe if I include all that traveling time, maybe it's just as much now, okay? But it, it, is, it is less hours, but it's not any less serious, Okay, it's still work, and your wife needs to understand that she needs to be grave. It says, "Wives be grave." The next one that comes up, and it's so important, this comes up for ladies, not slanderers. Right, First Timothy three eleven, not slanderers. Now I'm going to get you guys to turn to Jeremiah chapter six, please. Jeremiah chapter six. <coughs> not slanderers. Okay, I'm going to read to you from Numbers fourteen verse thirty five. And uh, we looked recently at the, uh, you know, the children of Israel in the wilderness. And in Numbers 14, verse 35, the Bible says, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil generation <clears throat> that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed and where, uh, sorry, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him. Look at this by bringing up a slander upon the land. What does the Bible say? What is this slander? Verse 37, even those men that did bring up an evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. So, of course, these, these spies that went out to the land of Canaan to spy it out, you know, they came back with slander according to God. What does that mean? You know, that they're the ones that didn't have the faith to go into the promised land. They're the ones that didn't have the faith to say, hey, we're able to conquer the people, you know, the Canaanites. And they came back with this evil report. They're saying, hey, look, we can't take this land. You know, these people are going to destroy us. Hey, these are lies. You know, God had promised them to go into that land. What are they doing? What does God call slander? They're going against his word, primarily. They're going against his word. You know, they're telling untruths. They're saying we can't do it when God says, yes, you can do it. They're not telling the truths. They're telling lies. They're deceiving the people. They're fooling the people into thinking or, or to having a lack of faith. That's the first time that we see slander in the Bible. It's being against the word of God. It's not telling the full truth of things, deceiving the hearts of the people against, against here, against Moses, against the, the pastor. And, you know, this happens in churches. Many times the ladies will turn the hearts of their husbands or the hearts of other families against the pastor. Why? Because the pastor didn't say hi to them one day. You know, the pastor just, you know, for some reason forgot to do something that, you know, that they were, you know, they were waiting for, for the pastor to do. Say, look, the pastor's let me down. They'll turn their hearts against the pastor just like these men had turned their hearts against or had caused people to, the Israelites to turn their hearts against Moses. Now, you guys are in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 28. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 28. And what I want to show you here is that slander is a characteristic of a reprobate. Now, how much, how much does God hate reprobates? Okay, did you know this is associated with a reprobate, being a slanderer? 
in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 28, <clears throat> look at this. Uh, and this speaking, of course, is a prophesying, uh, prophesying uh, judgment um, onto Judah. It says in Jeremiah 6, 28, they are all grievous revolters. Look at this. Walking with slanders. That's important to notice. It's not just slanders, but they're walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. Now, the reason brass and iron gets brought up here is because soon God will refer to silver. Okay, and, and silver, of course, um, is, is, a, is a metal that is, you know, uh, rare. It's beautiful. It, it doesn't corrupt. Um, but when, when, you know, when brass and iron are cheap metals, they're cheap metals and they, they easily rust and these kinds of things. Okay, they're all corruptors like brass and iron. Verse 29, look at this. The bellows are burned. The lead, so this is another metal, the lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Okay, the Lord has rejected them. Go to Jeremiah chapter 9 now. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3. I just want to show you how serious slander is. You know, God associates this with being reprobate. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3. And they bend their tongues like a bow for lies. Okay, this is all associated with being a slanderer, someone who tells lies. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil. This reminds me of the walking with slanders. They're going from one place to another place, from evil to evil. <clears throat> Verse number, uh, sorry, keep it, verse number three. And they know, sorry, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. There's again the walking with slanders. And they will deceive everyone his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to commit iniquity. So you see they're, they're, they're trying to deceive the neighbors. It's not just that they have a lie or a miscommunication or a misunderstanding. They're trying to cause other people, you know, to, to be deceived by, by their, their slanders. Verse number six, their habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. And here it is again, therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will melt them. It's like in the furnace, melt them and try them. For how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Man, just, just horrible words how, you know, God speaks of the slanderers, liars, deceivers, deceitful people, going from evil to evil, trying to deceive their neighbors. That's what a slanderer does, okay? And I can't tell you guys, just time and time again, my whole life, every church I've been at, every church, guess who's always fighting? Guess who's always looking at other people's families and speaking bad of them? commonly i'm not saying it's never the men but more often than not it's the ladies it just keeps happening okay and now one thing we need to realize with the bible when these things come up it's because god knows we're naturally inclined we're naturally sinful to do these kinds of things when the bible says not slanderers you know why he puts that in there because our wives will naturally want to slander when they see something wrong when they see a family not behaving properly or they see issues with another family they should see issues with another wife or whatever they want to talk about it. they want to get it off their chest you know they, 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 and and here's the thing sometimes those things are honest things that are that are issues but many times it becomes slander many times you start to exaggerate the truth you start telling lies you start making things seem much worse than they've been before and they go from neighbor to neighbor walking with a slander spreading the news you know trying to cause problems within the church i'm telling you guys i've seen this in every single church please go to first timothy chapter 5 first timothy chapter 5 verse 13 first timothy chapter 5 verse 13 <clears throat> first timothy chapter 5 verse 13 speaking of the ladies here and with all they learn to be idle wandering from house to house that's what we saw the slanderer doing right going from evil to evil going from neighbor to neighbor walking in their slander wandering about from house to house and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. Man, man, we need to be careful with our wives. First of all, I know we're talking about the, the wives of bishops and deacons, but this should be the rule for all, all of us, man. You know, that we need to put a stop when we start hearing our wives speaking evil things, okay, bringing that evil report, if we know it's exaggerated. Now, look, 
if your wife is frustrated, something's consumed, something's happened in church or something's happened, you know, you should be there. You should be there. You're her head to hear her out. What's the problem, honey? And maybe you can even stop the issue right there and then. Many times you're like, you know what, honey, I think you're exaggerating. You know what? No, she's not ignoring you. She's paid attention to you nine out of ten times. Just that one Sunday she's forgotten about you, right? And you can bring, bring it back, you know, bring it back stable, you know, bring it back to, to where it should be. But if you don't listen to your wife, if you don't hearken to her voice, if you don't let her get her off her chest, where is she going to go if you don't listen to her? She's going to go to her friend, isn't she? She's going to go to another lady in the church, you know, but because you failed the first time to hear her out. Now, if I hear her out and say, honey, look, maybe, maybe you've got a legitimate issue there, but please don't go and spread it to any other lady. Please don't go and spread it to anybody else because we don't know if this is true. We don't know 100% yet. You know, let's just wait. If there, if there are other issues, and be me as a pastor, if I see some major issues, then at the end of the day, it's going to be my decision. We're going to look at this later, that our wives are there to help us in, our, in, our, in the offices that we do have, though they don't have an official capacity. But hey, you know, bring it to my attention. Maybe now I can be aware of the situation so then I can address it if it gets worse, you know, if it doesn't get sorted out. So we need to remember this, men. Many times when our, when, our, when our wives go and speak to another woman about issues, it's usually because you've not heard them out in the first place. Or maybe you've heard them out, but you've not done uh, your proper uh, diligence to sort that issue out with her, to, to, to make her feel like, hey, my husband's heard me, and you know, he's, he's taken it on board. When, when she feels like she's, you're not heard her is when she's going to take it to somebody else. Let's keep going there. Verse number 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion, look at this, to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. When, when the women are tattling, when they're gossiping, when they're going from house to house speaking of other people, what does the Bible say this is? They've turned aside after Satan. They're doing exactly what Satan wants them to do. They're going around destroying churches. They're going around destroying the reputation of other people, you know. And, and we need to be careful, we need to make sure, especially if you're going to get into this office. And look, it's not, it's not that, oh yeah, I'll sort out my wife when I become a bishop. I'll sort out my wife when I become a deacon. No, you sort it out now. You sort it out now. Because if you don't sort it out and you desire to be a, a bishop, you desire to be, you don't sort it out, then uh, your wife's actions are going to disgrace you. It's going to disgrace her. Who's, th- who's going to want to lay hands on you when everybody in the church hates you because of all the slander that's going around and they know your wife's been involved in a lot of those things? You know, are your wives slanderers? Are they gossip? Look, what I learned from this is, that, again, they're naturally inclined to do this. This is why it's in the Bible. You know, that's why men, you know, husbands love your wives, right? Why is it there? Because naturally we're, we're inclined to not love her the way we ought to. We're, 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 we're inclined to more love ourselves and, and not to love our, our, love our wives the way Christ loved the church. And so we need these instructions to get us you know, in line, to get us you know, on, on, on God's you know, framework, his, his pattern to, to live after. We need to show our wives these things, especially when they're facing slander or they've heard gossip or people have come to them with issues that you know, hey, that's actually not my business. Why do I need to know about this? If this is a business between you and another lady, I don't actually need to know about that. You should be taking that to the other lady there and sorting that. I don't need, I don't need to know. I don't want to think bad of that person. That's, that's the attitude your wife needs to have. You need to sort it out now before she destroys her reputation and your reputation. Now, you know, if, if you're asking the questions, you know, because again, you know, we've got that soft spot for our wives, okay? And, and we hearken. We saw, we saw how men hearken to the voice of their wives and give in. And, and these kinds of things. So, you know, sometimes you might find excuses. You know, your wife may have been involved in slander. She may have been involved in gossip. But you'll find, because of that soft spot, you'll find, well, maybe she was justified in this. Maybe, maybe, look, no. <laughs> okay. As soon as it happens, you need to, as soon as you know about it, men, please put a stop to it. Put a stop to it. This is how you know if your wife is a slanderer. Okay. This, this is how you know. And, and this is something that I've learned, again, being a father, you know, again, being in business and, and managing a lot of people. I, I don't know if this phrase exists as, as a rule, but this is something I've come up with. I call it the common denominator rule, the common denominator rule. This is just something I've made up, right? And this is something I've learned, especially after having a bunch of kids, is that when you've got a couple of kids, one or two kids, and they're fighting, you can usually sort things out. You can usually work out who's done wrong and who's done right. But when you've got a bunch of them, and there's, there's like, you wake up one morning, and there's like, there's already been like three fights maybe four fights in the morning, you know, people are, are complaining and arguing. The common denominator is usually, sometimes it's just, there's always that one child 
that's involved in every single fight that took place. And now I know who the, who the fault is. Now I know who the culprit is. Now I know who's causing problem because every other sibling is not involved in all the fights, but that one sibling is involved in all the fights. That's the common denominator. That's the common problem. That's the one you need to sort out, okay? And, uh, and this, again, in the workplace, I've, I've had to work with employees. Sometimes, I don't know. I don't know who started it. I don't know where the problem is. But then a second fight happens, a second argument happens, a third, fourth conflict happens, a fifth conflict, well, how do I, it's always that same woman. It's always that same one. Hey, she's the slanderer. That's the one, it's a common denominator, okay? And look, if your wife is the common denominator in the conflicts that you've been hearing about and things like that, guess what? Your wife is a slanderer. Deal with it, okay? Now it's your job to be the husband and say, hey, I need to put a stop to this. Honey, you know, the Bible says this, what we're learning today. You know, we need to make sure this is something that you can change about yourself, okay? We all have to grow. We all have to mature. This is now, look, next time this happens, this is how you're going to deal with it, okay? You need to change that. You don't want it to destroy your reputation, destroy your opportunity one day potentially to be a bishop or a, or a deacon, all right? So the common denominator rule, I'm going to maybe copyright that. That's, that's my rule. That's how I work out problems when there's a bunch of people involved, okay? Anyway, the next thing there in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter... Uh, 3 verse 11, not slanderers, and then sober. Okay, sober. So we've looked at sobriety many times. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're just going to keep our, our focus on 1 Peter here, just to look at sober. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter actually deals a lot with sobriety as, as, a, as a topic. First Peter chapter 1 verse 13. Of course, these verses are for all of us, but let's apply it to our wives, Okay. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says here, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. Okay, so what's sobriety? What's being sober? Having control of your mind. You know, being in control of the emotions, being in control of the environment. You know, being, uh, you know, yeah, just having control. And it says here, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children... Look, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Okay, so as obedient children, now again, let's apply this to our wives. Our wives should be submissive to their husbands. Okay, therefore, we should teach our, ch- our wives to be obedient un- un- under our leadership. Okay, you say, oh man, my wife's a bit rebellious. You know, how do I do this? It's easy. It's actually pretty easy. It's hard, but it, no, doing it is hard, but knowing what to do is easy. Okay, the, uh, knowing what to do is basically love her as Christ loved the church. Honestly, if your wife just sees that you love her, you give her security, you give her the comfort, you'd be willing to lay down your life for your wife, it's going to be so much easier for her to be submissive to you. I mean, isn't it easy for us to be submissive to Christ knowing how much he's done for us? Isn't that, I mean, isn't that, we know that, right? Well, it's the same thing, believe it or not, with our wives. I mean, that's why the Bible compares, you know, the relationship between husband and wife to the relationship between Christ and his church. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. So your wives ought to be obedient to you, husbands, the head of your wives. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Look at this. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Another thing that you're going to find very similar when you look up the word sober in the Bible, sober and watching, you know, come hand in hand many times. Being sober-minded, being watchful, you know, being aware, being, being alert of situations. And I personally believe that women are much more aware. They've got another sense, they've got like this sixth sense about situations. They, they seem to know when there's danger before men do, okay? They seem to be aware, they just have it, they just have it in them, okay? And sometimes they can overreact, and we, we need to, you know, sort that out, right? But we shouldn't, also, we shouldn't ignore the concerns of, of, the, of, the, of your wives, okay? We shouldn't ignore them either, because they're, they're aware they should be watching about things. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. And by it said, it said, watch unto prayer. You soon see that prayer is also a key thing uh, that we, our wives should be involved in. Uh, but 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Again, look, be sober, be vigilant. You know, a vigil, that means to watch, that watching, the sober, the watching, there again. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. All right, so again, we saw the woman going from house to house. What was she doing? She had turned aside after Satan. 
She had been, you know what happened when she's done that? She's been devoured by the devil at that point. When she's going out there gossiping about other families, about other situations, she's been swallowed up by the devil, okay? And so, you know, she wasn't sober, she wasn't vigilant. Husbands, you probably weren't sober, you weren't vigilant either uh, to, to prevent that from happening, okay? And uh, again, you know, I, I don't want you to, you know, panic if, if your wives have been involved in issues and conflicts and situations and gossip and all that. It happens, it happens, okay? But the key thing is we need to fix that. We need to make sure it gets fixed, okay? And if there's been damage, we need to try to undo that damage as well. We need to try to go and rectify those things as, as best as we can, all right? So the thing that I want to bring to your attention here is being obviously sober. We're talking about the wives being sober. They need to be vigilant, watching again. They've got that sense that men we usually don't have for whatever reason, okay? So, you know, um, it kind of reminds me of a deacon. Like a deacon is someone that, is, that is sort of has to be aware, self-aware of situations and being that help unto the bishop. And same kind of thing, that, you know, wives, many times, pastors' wives will notice things in the church that the pastor doesn't notice. You know, honestly, when I'm preaching, when I'm preaching a sermon, like, my focus and attention is, like, solely on the sermon. Like, people can be walking in, kids can be getting a bit noisy and restless. It's a little bit distracting, but really, my mind's so focused on, on, on here that I don't realize what's going on. Sometimes I have people come up to me and apologize, say, look, I'm sorry for sleeping, or something like that. Like, you know, especially down in Sydney, because it's later, like, Tuesday, traveling from work and all that kind of stuff. It's like, I'm sorry, like, I didn't even know you were sleeping. <laughs> I was just so focused on the sermon, you know, don't worry about it, you know. Or people come in late, I'm sorry, I didn't even know you came in, I didn't know you, you were late or anything, you know, because I'm so focused on these things. And so it's good for your wife, you know, it's, again, it's not an official capacity, but all, she's going to be watching, she's going to be able to see things that you don't see, so hark and listen to the voice of your wife. She might give you good pointers, things that are issues within the church that then, oh, I need to fix that. Then. I, I had no idea. I had no idea about that, okay? It's not that you're stupid. It's just that uh, when you take on this office, you've got other responsibilities. You, you're doing other things. You know, sometimes I see visitors come in and I want to see it, but I'm trying to organize my sermons, trying to organize the things, and I'm trying to just pray for the service as well. And I, I, sometimes I might forget to, to greet the visitor, but, you know, it's just because you've got so many things on your mind, especially when the service is, is happening. And I, I'm someone that really, I have such a fear when the service is on. I have such a fear when I'm getting up to preach because I'm always thinking, God, these are the best people in the world. These are the sons of God. Please help me to preach the best sermon that I can. Please help me not to make a mistake. And, and so, you know, my mind is filled with all these kinds of things. So, you know, your wife ought to be sober. She ought to be watchful. Pay attention to the things she says. If she finds issues within the church, listen to her. Okay, listen to her. You probably wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And uh, the other thing about being sober, again, being watchful, again, you don't need to turn there. I'll just read to you from Genesis 2.18. It said here, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Speaking of the wife. The wife has been made to be a help, meet or suitable for the church? No, for him, okay, for the husband, okay? And so wives, you know, if a woman listens, listens to this and your husband, your husband is a pastor or a deacon, you should be watching and helping out your husband, not in the ministry, but you know, sometimes your husband can get like caught up in, in, in uh, you know, can become maybe stressful. He might be overworking. He might be overthinking things. Maybe he's not looking after his health. And that's where the wives need to step in and say, honey, look, you need to take a day off. You know, you know and, and, and uh, give him a, a good meal. You know, get, make sure he realizes, hey, you need to have a rest, especially when, you know, the wives see that their husbands are working maybe too hard. You know, and they can try to put a stop to that. They can be watchful, sober, being that, that help meet for the husband, okay? Again, something I noticed with men, we can work really hard and forget, not realize that we're exhausted, not realize we're stressed, but our wives start to pick up on these things and realize you're stressed, you need to slow down. So our wives play an important part to be that help suitable to the husband, whether they're a pastor or not. Okay. The next thing that we see there in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is uh, grave, not slanderous, sober, and then faithful in all things. Faithful in all things. Now, we don't have a list of all things here in this chapter, but I thought it'd be good to turn to Titus chapter 2, please. Uh, yeah, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Because so I want to deal with a couple of things here. And if you remember when we were looking at, we've looked at other times of the widows in, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, because it, it defines what a, what a younger woman is. And if you remember, you know, the Bible defines basically if you're 60 years and over, that you're more of an elderly person. If you're 60 years and younger, you know, according to the women, it's, they, the Bible calls them a younger woman. So I just want to just think about that as a 60 years old, so there's this cut-off point between elderly and younger. So when we go to Titus chapter 2, verse 1, Titus chapter 2, verse 1, this is obviously uh, instructions to a pastor, but look at this. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. 
that the aged men, so here we've got aged men, you, you, later on we have young men, we have aged women, later on we have young women. But he says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now, I'll stop there for a moment because some people read this in Titus chapter 2 and say, well, look, the aged woman at the end of verse number 3 are teachers of good things. So shouldn't we expect the pastor's wife to be a teacher of good things? Isn't that an expectation that we see here in the Bible? But I want you to notice what it said here. Who's to be the teacher? Who's to be the teacher? The aged woman. The aged woman. And who are they to teach? Look at verse number 4. That they may teach the young women. And according to uh, 1 Timothy 5, who are the younger women? Those under 60. So is this saying that pastors' wives ought to be teachers in the church or teachers to the other women in the church? No, this is saying that aged women, aged women are to be the teachers, you know, to the younger women. And of course, if we use that as a guideline, 60 years old, well, this kind of makes sense. Why? Because at 60 years old, you're probably, you could be, and we saw with the issue there, you could be a widow, At 60 years old, you haven't got little kids anymore, right? Your kids definitely have grown up into adulthood by now. They probably left their house. They probably got their own families. You don't have as much, what I'm trying to say is, these aged women don't have as much to do around their house as they once did, all right? So in order for them to remain productive, in order for them to remain as as servants and, 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 and a help to other believers, hey, a good instruction, hey, an aged woman, you've got a lot of experience, you've, you've raised kids, you've done a lot of, you know, you served your husband, you've done so well, hey, maybe you've got words of wisdom, you've got words of advice to this next generation, to these younger women. So it's not saying pastor's wife are the ones that ought to be teaching other women in the church. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. You know, if, if as pastor's wife you're able to take care of the children, take care of the kids, and then you say, you know what, honey, I think I, I, can, I can help the ladies. I'd like to put on a, a session for the ladies. That's great. I'm, I'm, all for, I'm, not, I'm, not, you know, I'm all for that. But there's no expectation. There's no mandatory requirement from the Bible in order to do that. Because I've heard people use this to, to basically teach that. That that's the role of you know, the pastor's wife to teach the younger women. The pastor's wife is probably the younger woman. <laughs> all right? and she might need to be the one that's being taught by the aged woman you know, to raise the children. And look at this. What, what are they to be taught? Because uh, we were talking about faithful in all things, right? What are they to be taught? Um, their number, sorry, what, verse, number, verse number four. What are, the, what are they to teach? That they may teach the young women to be sober. We saw that already. To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. We don't want, especially if you're taking an office, as a bishop and deacon, you don't want the word of God to be blasphemed by the behavior of your wife. How bad does that look if you're the, supposed to be the leader in the church? All right, so let's look at these things. I'm thinking about what are these faithful in all things? Well, for me, it makes sense that this would be the list of where she needs to be faithful in all these things. So as, when it comes to being sober, we've already covered that. The next thing was to love their husbands. All right, now here's what happens sometimes in churches. Okay, you have the aged women... They see the younger women, you know, struggling with the family, struggling with the kids. You know, it's a lot of work. You know, maybe the homeschooling is struggling. You know what the aged women sometimes do? You know what, honey, you deserve a break. You know, your husband should be doing more to help you out around the house. You know, you know, you know what? Just, just, you know, once you get, get, out, get out of the house, you know, forget the kids for a while. I've, that's the advice a lot of aged women give to the young women. No. You know, you know, help them, instruct them how to manage that heavy lifestyle. You've done it yourself. Well, you should have done it yourself. Now you can be a help to those ladies. Maybe you can help out. Hey, would you like me to come? The aged women, right? Would you like, because, you know, they haven't got families for themselves. Would you like me to come maybe once a month and help you clean up a little bit? You know, can I come and do the laundry? Can I come and do those things? Hey, that's being a servant to the brethren in the church. But you can do that because you haven't got your own family to take care of anymore. You're an aged woman. Okay, you can teach these things. You can be a blessing to other people. You know, my wife is not going to come to your house to help your wife clean up. All right? She's already cleaning up 10. All right? She's already cleaning up me, my mess. Right? And, and the mice that we have in the house at the moment. She's cleaning up that mess. Right? We're sorting out a few mouse issues at the moment in our, in our house. But uh, the next thing was to love their children. To love their children. Again, the instruction from aged women that I've heard is, yeah, you know what? You're doing too much. You need, to, you, know, you need to relax or put your kids in the school. No, no. Teach them to love their children. 
What does the Bible say about loving children? Proverbs 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Men, teach your children to teach these younger women to love their children. How do you love them? By disciplining. Getting that rod of correction. Be times early as soon as they disobey. Hey, don't, don't wait. You know, deal with it straight away. Deal with disciplining your kids. That's showing them love. That's what the aged women need to be teaching the younger women. Hey, and that's what your wife ought to be doing if you have an office, is that they are disciplining the children. The children, you know, it's obvious to everybody else. Hey, the children, listen to mum and dad. Hey, it's obvious that they must be disciplined because look how well behaved they are. You know, look how they can, you know, sit still and, and these kinds of things. They listen to the instructions of the parents. These things are obvious to everybody else, you know. And um, what else? Uh, it said discreet. Discreet. Now, some of you guys might not know exactly what discreet means. I didn't actually, I didn't have this nailed down until t- uh, this afternoon. But I, I used to think, and it's, it is tied in, but I used to think discreet meant, you know, uh, quiet or hidden. So, like, if I walked in discreetly, you know, it's like you know, nobody realizes that I walked into the building today. It does kind of have a bit of that thought, but it's, it's not so much that. The word discreet comes from the word discern. Discern, discreet, meaning it, it's someone that has wisdom. Okay, wisdom. And I'll just read to you, exa- for example, you don't need to turn there. Genesis 41, verse 39. Genesis 41, verse 39. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God have showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Okay, so it's someone that can discern. You have wisdom. You have knowledge. You're able to work out what is right, what is wrong. You have discernment. Okay, and your wife needs to be someone who's discreet, who has wisdom. Okay, she shouldn't be an airhead, not knowing what to do. You know, oh, my kids are misbehaving, what do I do? No, no, that's not being discreet, that's not being wise. You need to take control of situations, you know. Uh, it, it, you know, because one day, you know, what happens is, and I know this isn't really her job, but it's going to happen when you have younger ladies come up to, you know, the pastor's wife and say, hey, can you show me, how, did you, how do you do this? How, how, how do you manage the household? How do you homeschool your kids? And one thing I always tell my wife Please always make sure they feel empowered. Whatever advice you give, say, you know, this is how we do it, okay? But understand, Kevin can come home early to help me out because he's now the pastor of a church. Understand that, you know, we've got older kids that are helping the younger kids as well in the homeschool work. So this is how we do it, but your situation's different. You know, your husband might work longer hours. You know, you might have different types of children, you know, your, your children might learn a little bit differently. You know, if you have kids, you'll notice that kids learn differently from others. And so this is how we do it, but you need to work out how to do it for your family. Here are some tips that I can give you, but please don't do things exactly the same because it's not going to work. That's being wise. You can't just upload your family's schedule and download it into another family. I, I see, I've seen, again, many young ladies make these mistakes. They think, wow, look at, look at you know, Sister so-and-so, she seems to have it all sorted out. I'm just going to get all the information from her and do it exactly the same and it all fails. Okay? That's not being wise. That's not discerning. You need to gain, gain the knowledge and say, well, this is my family. This is my husband. This is the time he works. This is the time he comes home. You know, this is when I have time to cook a meal. This is, how my, this is the bedtime for my kids. You know, this, this is the, you know we, have, we have five kids. We have ten kids. We have two kids. You know, how do I sort out my, my life? You've got to empower. You've got to give the wise wisdom. You know, husbands, you need to step in there and help them to organize their houses sometimes, okay? Because, you're, again, you're the head of your house. But that's what it means to be discreet. You have knowledge, okay? The other thing about being discreet, which ties in a little bit with that, you know, being careful when you walk in, being quiet, is sometimes as well as the pastor's wife or the deacon's wife, you're going to hear information about other people, okay? Because, again, you know, uh, someone might come up to Christina, my wife, and say, hey, look, I've got this issue can you pray for me? I don't want to tell anyone else in the church right now, but, you know, can you just, I just just feel comfortable if if you know to pray about that. You know, would my wife be wise to come to church the next service and go, hey, everyone, (laughs) you know, sister so-and-so said this, you know, and and just tell everybody about, no, that's not being discreet. That's not being wise, okay? Or I might have information, of course, as the pastor. I hear about things. I know about situations. You know, I hear some private matter. And then I might even tell my wife, hey, honey, what do you think about this? We should pray about this together. You know, is, is then she going to take that and, you know, go and spread it and be a slanderer, be a gospel? No, she's got to be discreet. She's got to be wise 
You know, you've got to be aware of the information she receives and be mindful. How do I distribute this? Do I share this information? Do I not share this information? You know, you, you've got to be wise with the information that you have. So yeah, discreet can tie in with their, you know, being kind of quiet about that. And sometimes you do have to be quiet about certain things because you're trying to protect somebody else. And then the next thing we've got here is chaste, okay? I don't have a lot to say about chaste, but of course chaste is basically someone of good behavior, someone that's not indecent or lewd. You know, your, your wife, as, as, especially as someone that holds the office, ought to be seen as, yeah, you know what, she's, she's a good woman. She's, she's not someone of bad behavior. Next one, keepers at home. Wow. Keepers at home. Now, you know, I, I really, now, first of all, I'm in, I believe every woman, every wife should be a keeper at home. I believe that, okay? But I also recognize that for whatever reasons, maybe mistakes in the past, sometimes women get out there into the workforce for whatever reason, if it's a part-time job or these and that, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not my call. It's, it's the husband's decision. It's between her and the husband. It's between her and the Lord if she gets out there and, and, and does, has a job or whatever. But I truly believe if you're going to be a pastor or a deacon, you have to be in a position where your wife can remain to be a housekeeper because she's setting an example Okay, she's setting an example. Be a housekeeper. Keepers at home. All right, this is so important because again, you're setting the example. Other people are watching now. If they look at your example, they go, "Wow, that's nice. She seems to be a good housekeeper. They seem to have it all together." But I decide to go and work anyway. Well, that's not not your problem. But if your wife's out there in the workforce, guess what's going to happen to the other ladies? They're going to go, well, "Hold on, Pastor's wife is out there working. Why don't she let me go and work?" It's just going to happen. Whether that's right or wrong, that's going to happen. I truly believe, as a pastor, as a deacon. Your wife needs to be at home. Be the homemaker, okay? Be in charge of that area. And that's going to free you up as a pastor or a deacon to serve in the church more, knowing that the house issues are taken care of, okay? Now, I, I, I do a lot of the things around the house as well, you know, especially now that I've been able to come up on the Sunshine Coast. You know, our shopping trolley is massive, okay? There's no way my little wife is ever going to push that trolley, that shopping trolley. So I, I usually take care of the shopping now, okay? I mean, I just fill it up. You know, and, and we take that, you know, I, I basically take that down uh, to the house these days. I take that responsibility now in the house to help her out. But she's got many other responsibilities than before when she used to do that, those kinds of tasks. So, you know, she needs to be at home dealing with those things. There's a lot of work in the house. And then it says good. So good is kind of like what we saw before, chaste. But, you know, good kind of has to do with moral standards, not being a horrible person, you know, <laughs> How bad, right? Uh, you know, how bad if your wife is just this horrible person that nobody can get along with? They like the past. The past is okay, but your wife's, man, I can't even, I don't even, I'm scared to talk to your wife. I'm scared to, oh, that's such a bad thing. She needs to be someone that is good with high standards, with moral standards. You know, she's not a bad person. And the next one there is, look at this, obedient to their own husbands. Obedient to their own husbands. That means the wife has to be under subjection to her husband. You know, um, and I'll talk, if the wives are listening to this later on, you know, if your husband wants to be a pastor, a deacon, these kinds of things, you know, you're going to let him down if you're not under subjection. Again, these things become obvious over time to everybody else. You know, they know, is this, who's in charge actually? Is it, is it the man? I think the wife's in charge of the house, right? <laughs> these things, it just becomes obvious, okay? And again, you know, every family to themselves, every man's the head of his home. If he wants to run it that way, that at the end of the day, it's going to be his business between him and the Lord but you're not going to put a good representation forward. You're not going to be a good example, and people may uh, not re want you to be the, the, the leader of a church because they see you weak as a leader. If you're going to be weak as a leader with your wife, you're going to be weak as a leader in the church, obviously. Okay? And then the last one, it says at the end, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That the word of God be not blasphemed. So all of these are important for a wife. If, if any of this stuff is being skipped, you know, faithful in all things, the Bible says. If any of these things are being skipped, then the word of the God is being blasphemed. Okay, it's being blasphemed. You know, do we want as pastors, people that are trying to love the Lord, trying to serve the Lord, do we want the word of the Lord to be blasphemed? Of course not. But you know, it can be blasphemed by a disobedient wife. It can be blasphemed by a wife that's not a keeper at home. It can be blasphemed by a wife that's a gossiper. Man, what a bad state. And there's a lot of pastors like this. A lot of pastors like this where their wives are in control, they're, or they're out of control, I should say, and it's obvious, it's obvious, and it's such a bad look. So uh, that's what I really wanted to cover today, you know, the wives of bishops and deacons. Now, this, of course, is important for every woman. Every woman can learn from this, just like every man can learn from the office of a bishop and a deacon, okay? But 
if you have a desire for this office, you need to get this sorted out. You need to sort out your wives. Okay, Love them. Love them as Christ loved the church. Then they can be easily more submissive to you. Show them what the Bible says. Honey, I have a desire one day. You know, I don't know what day this is, but one day I have a desire to take on this office. Look, you're lacking in this area. Okay? When it comes to the slander, you've been involved in every slander of, of, over the last you know, few years. You know, honey, maybe you're the common denominator. Okay? Maybe you're the one. We need to sort this out now. We need to start setting good examples, start having a good report, have a good reputation. Otherwise, this might prevent me in the future from taking on that office. All right, let's pray.